So today we are meeting with Owen Hazerly and uh, we plan to discuss uh, online uh, the topic of Soviet Orientalism and uh, exotization that we both like to discuss a lot. <laughs> and this discussion is a part of a bigger project, Ukrainian Constructivism, that is supported by Ukrainian Cultural Foundation this year. And we are happy to meet each other uh, during that beautiful project. And me, Zhenya Gubkina, an architect and historian. Uh, so you are very famous in post-Soviet space uh, because of your numerous of books. For example, I have here that beautiful, beautifully designed book, The Adventures of Owen Hazerly in the Post-Soviet Space. Very beautiful one. Even these Soviet metro stations. And of course, this one, Landscapes of Communism. And uh, you are uh, somehow re deeply related to Soviet heritage, I think, and you had uh, experience to be in here and uh, to be related with the uh, Soviet phenomena in general. So my first question will be, how did you begin that huge journey or route or path uh, to Soviet heritage and uh, again more broadly uh, into Soviet in general? Yeah, I mean, actually, the the first, the second came first, so I should probably talk about it first. Um, these are probably sort of topics that are sort of slightly slightly delicate in in, in Ukraine nowadays. So I'll be as I'll be as honest as as, as possible. So um, obviously, I, I, I if you know Victor Serge, the the the. Um, the kind of Russian Belgian revolutionary Victor Serge um, grew up in a kind of uh, sort of Narodnik terrorist kind of family in the late nineteenth century, and he said, "You know, our our our, our quarters were always full of pictures of um, people that have been executed." And in a less glamorous way, this was basically what it was like when I was growing up in the nineteen eighties, like. There was, like, I grew up in a family who were in a sort of Trotskyist sect that was then uh, sort of entered the Labour Party um, called Militant. And so because of that, there was just pictures of Trotsky everywhere. There was pictures of Lenin everywhere. There was, you know, there was sort of dead Russians on the wall all over the place. Um, so this kind of, you know, it was just something that was always part of growing up. And... On my mum's side, my grandparents were in the Communist Party, so there was also there was also that you would go to their house, and although they'd kind of drifted away from it in time, their bookshelves would be full of all of this stuff. And because they were obviously in the Communist Party, so they were you know in the in, in the kind of Catholic Church of it, as it were. We were in the Protestant Church. Um, because they were in the Catholic Church, they had all of the stuff about the the mother country. So you had all of these kind of um, magazines and books about how wonderful the new um, socialist sixth of the world was. And so it was simply a kind of ambient thing growing up. It was always kind of there. Um, some sort of interest in the Soviets. So obviously my grandparents, my maternal grandparents sort of embraced it in some way. My parents rejected it or kind of rejected it after a certain point for them, you know, kind of everything after about 1921 was bad. But before that, they were kind of okay with it. Um, kind of, you know, a very specific um, sort of quasi-religious way of looking at these things, I suppose. Um, but nonetheless, you had to sort of define yourself against it. You know, it was just like a thing that was considered of great significance. And obviously I was, you know, I was uh, 10 years old in 1991. So, like, you know, I, my own memory of it is is pretty hazy. And it's not somewhere, you know, that actually... I knew people who had been there in the 1980s um, during Perestroika. And my aunt went there in the 1970s before Perestroika because she was learning Russian and it was a, there was a kind of school trip. Um but it was still somewhere that was sort of both kind of close and distant at once. 
But the answer as to how getting to Soviet architecture is much, much more local and comes from an interest in modern architecture here in the UK. Um, so I um, had always sort of been interested in it kind of casually because I grew up in a city which was, I mean, you know, not, by, not on an Eastern Front scale, but was bombed quite heavily in 1940 and 1941. So it was rebuilt very extensively in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So I grew up in a very, very, you know, surrounded by a very, very modernist environment. And so it was always the thing that had interested me. And later, kind of coming to the kind of theory of modern architecture, understanding that there was a whole kind of body of ideas behind it and why those things ended up as they did kind of created a very, very big interest in 20th century architecture, especially modern architecture. And if you trace the roots of that architecture, if you work out where it actually comes from, you inevitably end up at the Soviet Union. You, I mean, there's, you know, there's a, there's a line you can trace it to the USA, to Frank Lloyd Wright, skyscrapers. There's a line you can trace it to, you know, Le Corbusier, August Perret. There's a line you can trace it to the Deutsche Werkbund. But really, the really dramatic stuff, you can trace it to Olesitsky, Vladimir Tatlin, Malevich, etc., etc. Um, and finding this out, Finding this out um, in the architecture history books, which I was reading very much as an amateur, I'm not trained as an architect or as an architectural historian, but finding them in the architecture books was very much like, oh, right, so these things are connected. You know, this thing that my, that, that my family believed in, that the October Revolution was this great event followed by this great disaster, actually connected to the idea of modern architecture, which was this great event followed by this great disaster. Um, and you could kind of put the two together and, and, and they, it was a really interesting way of telling the story. So I had a kind of casual interest from there and the writing that I had done beginning with my first book was a very much a mix of, so the first book was written in 2007 and published in 2009. Uh, called Militant Modernism. It's never been translated into Ukrainian, which is a shame, but it's been translated into Russian. Um, and it, it's very much about... The stuff about modern architecture in Britain is experiential. It's here I am going to a thing and writing about it. Whereas the stuff on, um, on Ukraine and on Russia is not... Is it was written before I travelled there. So it's much more speculative and much more exotic. And so in many ways, my sort of interest in the kind of problem of the sort of exoticization or orientalism of Soviet architecture is comes from very much doing it in my first book and having this kind of feeling later on that I had missed something because of that, that I'd kind of got some, I'd read something wrong from that and that you had to actually, you know, <laughs> you had to actually go there and talk to people. <laughs> that is the <that> point. <laughs> and a really very honest answer. And thank you very much for that. And uh, just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested, when it was first time when you visited some post-Soviet space? It would have been, it wouldn't have been that long ago, actually. It would be, I can't remember which was first. I think it was Russia first. So in March or April 2020 to, um, to Moscow and then to St. Petersburg. Oh no, the other way around, St. Petersburg and then to Moscow. And then the same year, I think that October or November to Kiev and then to Kharkiv. Um, so they're both in 2010. Um, I had before that spent time in Prague and Budapest and Warsaw. And particularly Warsaw is really, really important for me because um, it's where you kind of go for... Actually, Berlin is also very much part of the story, East Berlin. But Warsaw, more than anywhere else in the European Union, really, maybe outside of the Baltic states, is such an incredibly Soviet city. 
um, that you kind of have to confront it when you're there. You know, you, you can reject it or you accept it, but it, you can't avoid it. Um, whereas if you go to Prague or Budapest, you can avoid it. You, you can seek it out if you want to find it, but, you know, it's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make itself apparent to you. Whereas Warsaw, you get out of Warsaw Centralna and the first thing you see is the Palace of Culture. Like, it's just straight away, here it is, deal with it. So I first went to Warsaw in 2009, the year before, and I um, was in a relationship with uh, a writer there who was still very much friends. Um, she's very much a part of Landscapes of Communism, Agata Bizik. And for about five years, we lived together half the time in, in London and half the time in Warsaw. And so Warsaw was a very good place for going everywhere else. And I remember you have uh, one uh, one uh, journey to Zaporizhia, yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Am I right? So, that's right. So um, that was um, that was in 2015, I think. Winter 2015, in the year of the School of Kiev, the Biennale, the School of Kiev thing that, that my friends in uh, the Visual Culture Research Center were very much involved in, like Natalka Nasheva, Alexei Rudinsky, Sasha Balaka, et cetera. They were these people that I kind of known for about 10 or 11 years. And so, um, you know, when they were very involved in that, so I, I came over and spent a lot of time in Ukraine that year. Um, and while I was there, I was just very much like, there's certain things I have to see while they're still there. Um, and so I went to Zaporizhia and went to what was then still called Dnipropetrovsk and I kind of went around those. And of course, Zaporizhia, that's, you know, I, I knew what I was looking for when, whereas with Dnipropetrovsk, it was much more kind of go there and see what happens. Whereas Zaporizhia, because of the, 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 the Sodskorod and because of the dam, there's such a, you know, it's so incredibly important for 20th century modernism that I was very much like, right, I have to go here. <laughs> and you know that I, I live in Kharkiv and Kharkiv is like informal capital of constructivism in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, what do you think about Soviet constructivism again in general, considering that you have seen uh, its best examples, Gazprom, Der Shprom in Ukrainian, uh, Dniprogaz and even a lot of Sosgoros. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously, Kharkiv is the center of it, but, you know, pretty much every big um, city in central and southern and western, sorry, western, eastern Ukraine has um, has a lot of constructivism. And I guess it kind of connects with the interesting, one of the interesting things in a kind of, um, you know, if you're interested in what happens when ideas meet political reality, it's a really good place to sort of see architectural ideas meet the reality of the construction system. You know, that um, there's a very much an idea in, and we've talked about this before, um, there's very much an idea in um, the way architectural preservation works, that you must make something look exactly like it did the day it was built. Um, and it must look exactly like the drawing. So, um, Organizations like Doko Momo uh, very much support, but they very much have this idea of like, it should look like it was supposed to look. And there are very few Ukrainian and in general sort of uh, interwar Soviet modern modernist buildings that actually look like they were supposed to look. Um, one of the things that's so interesting about Dershprom is that it, it, it is basically, they did basically build the idea. But most of them, they didn't really. Like, um, you know, that you find what looks in the drawing like some sort of, like, beautiful, streamlined, elegant, utopian settlement. And you get there, and someone has, you know, in the, 19, in the later 1930s, someone put granite cladding on it, or some tufa, a bit of ornament, a cornice, you know, maybe a, maybe a bit of a pitched roof, a few statues... Then people have added their own balconies in the 90s. And so there's all of these things that have happened to it over time that have just taken it further and further away from that idea. Um, and what's interesting is when you can see elements of the idea and elements of the planning survive despite that. Um, 
And something like the Sword Skorod and Saparisha is interesting for that because the planning idea completely survives, but the architecture has been treated terribly practically since the minute it was it was built. Um, so yeah, it's uh, but so so some of them are very much like that, particularly in in Kiev and Saparisha. Um, and actually, in the centre of Kharkiv, you've kind of got you've obviously got Dershprom itself, where you know, despite you know the kind of bad renovation of a few years ago, with the kind of layer of the layer of cement at the front and then leaving the back. I don't know if it's still like that, but it was like that last time I checked. Um, the, but nonetheless, despite that, the, the building is is so strong and so elemental, and the geometry of it is so strong. And technologically, it's so advanced for its time that it actually, no matter what you do to it, it, sta it stays like that. But then surrounding it, you have all of the later buildings, like the House of Projects, the University, which were just completely transformed under Stalinism to the point where they, you wouldn't know they were constructive as buildings unless you're very, very kind of educated in the subject. And you can see the lines, you can see the planning ideas, see the geometries and go, OK, this is not style in this building. This is a constructivist building that's had a load of stone put on it. Um, so they've all kind of, they're all totally unlike that, that, that sort of idea that a building kind of exists outside of history. They all have history just all over them. And what you felt about that uh, being near, for example, House of Project with all that layers of Stalinist uh, decoration and uh, un understood that maybe that is constructivist building, felt you something like uh, pain or disappointment? Well, I suppose, so the thing is, I didn't know they were there. So they were buildings that I found out about from going to Kharkiv because of the fact that the building that's famous in, the, in, in, in Western Europe and North America is, is, is Dashprom. That's the building that's in, you know, it, it's in Rainer Banham, it's in Kenneth Frampton, Alan Cahoon, all the kind of, you know, the kind of big, you know, history of modern architecture men all did, all had to deal with it because it was, you know, along with the Bauhaus buildings in Dessau, the biggest modernist building in the world in the 1920s, right up until really after World War II, it was, the, you know, it was the biggest, um, the largest scale kind of um, actual building of modernist ideas that there was anywhere. So every, all the historians deal with it, but they don't know <laughs> that they're surrounded of these later extensions of the same building that then got kind of clad and, you know, covered in historicist ornaments. So, um, so they were a surprise. And I first did assume, oh, these must be stylish buildings. And only then researching them was I like, oh, right. So that's, that's what happened here. And one of the things, of course, is because you find that they complete the square. You know, that that kind of, um, in the original competition things, such as having this entire circus of huge buildings, it was actually substantially completed, except obviously not to the original designs. The only part that's finished to the original designs is Dejprom. Yeah, I I think that it's something even like uh, like uh, manipulation in space because uh, a lot of people who even work in the uh, house of project now it's a university uh, building, uh, so I mean professors, uh, historians, they still uh, don't know. Uh, that that building is actually a modernist building from the twenties, from the thirties. They really thought that that building was built uh, after the Second World War, and that is a typical uh, building of socialist realism. And I think that uh, administration of university should uh, put some uh, plate on the building with some uh, information because they they actually uh, produce historians. And uh, they should write somehow what is the truth uh, behind that decoration. Well, I wonder, if they said that, that there is precedent here. I don't know if you know, oh God, what's it called? There's a hotel in the centre of Warsaw built in the 30s. In not particularly, it was originally not particularly interesting, kind of in that sort of in-between, kind of half classical, half modernist style, probably about 14 storeys high. Um, and after 1945, it was reclad with socialist realist ornament 
And they've just taken it all off and redesigned it to make it look like it did in 1932. And it's not a very interesting building, so it's all a bit pointless. But it's kind of, it's sort of significant in Polish history, I suppose. It's the first Polish skyscraper and it was important in the Warsaw Uprising. But, it, you know, it's not as interesting as any of the buildings in Kharkiv. Half, half but it is very much shows that there is that kind of, sometimes people do do that of like, we shall take this building that was turned into this in the 50s and turn the clock back to the 30s. Something which I'm not really sure if I support, really. I'm not sure, too. Uh, you know, of course, uh, as a person who researched modernist architecture for years, uh, that is something... And even being architect, because, you know, being practical architect, it means to be a bit like modernist uh, itself. So, of course, I'm modernist. <laughs> and if uh, I build buildings, I'm still built uh, modernist uh, buildings. But... Uh, for me, of course, it would be a beautiful, very nice idea to remove all that Stalinist layer, you know, and to show the building uh, and to uh, to make that modernist revenge. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really something like a dream. But it's nothing about maybe uh, reality and it's nothing about some studying in history, st some understanding uh, about what is uh, our memory and uh, what happened actually after the Second World War, what happened with that building and why it happens. So I don't know what, what, what can be an approach, maybe some part of the building and just to talk about that, to, to build some discussion on that uh, situation maybe it would be better because uh, i think that uh, social discussion is much more important than just some material uh, explanation of what happened just to remove that and that mm. is all yeah absolutely because that would be the same approach you know like uh, stalinist architects they did the same in late 30s they put all the decoration and columns on the buildings and to make the same i don't know it's it's all the time the same shit. <laughs> we shouldn't do that, I think. <laughs> but of course, it's a beautiful idea. Uh, and um, so, from the outside, uh, from London, do you think that Soviet constructivism or modernism with uh, that strong, first of all, socialist uh, component has become somehow exotic? exotic um, for the whole world, or maybe uh, it has always been? Well, it sort of depends on the period. I mean, I remember um, having a commission a few years ago it's giving, giving a lecture about the engagement or otherwise of Western architects and architectural writers with post-1956 post Soviet modernism. And there's very little. At the time, there was real indifference to what was happening. Um, that particular period, there was, you know, which has recently been quite celebrated, you know, the, 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 that created sort of things like the Hotel Salyut and so on. While it was actually happening, no one in the West gave a damn. You know, if you just go on purely kind of like Western historiography, Soviet architecture goes avant-garde constructivism, Stalin, and then you leap 20 years and then you have Brodsky, paper architecture, etc. That's it. And that's how it was dealt with at the time. Um, whereas, obviously, lately it's become a bit of a cult. And this... And it hasn't applied to constructivism in the same way, I think, because a lot of the constructivist buildings are actually, they're less exotic in a way. And one of the ways in which they are less exotic is the fact that they are, although as discussed, they've often been kind of badly built or, or, or drastically changed, but they are in the mainstream of what was happening at the time in France, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Spain, Japan. You know, they were... That they were what, and they were part of those dialogues, a very central part of the dialogues about defining what a modern architecture was worldwide. Um, so, you know, and, and 
they were written about at the time constantly, constantly, you know. Western sort of travellers and architects would go there and discuss those buildings and engage with them. And vice versa, people like Elder Sitsky would come to Germany. Um, you know, that there was really this kind of, there was a dialogue going on. And though there are some examples of that dialogue happening after 1932, there are some examples, that dialogue kind of stops or is forced to stop. Um, so people find out about things from hearsay. Um, people in the Soviet Union know modern architecture in the USA from reading Architecture in the USA, the magazine specialising in architecture of the USA. They don't go and visit it, they don't see it, um, with a few minor exceptions. Um, and similarly, you know, um, people in the West, they don't, they don't engage with their colleagues in the same way. Um, if anything, the Soviets were way more engaged with what, with what American and European architects were doing than vice versa. So because of that, I think it's fair to say architecture developed in some quite strange directions. You know, you can find, uh, after that 1932 kind of like, um, you actually find that Soviet architecture does all sorts of things that you don't find in the West at the same time. There aren't Western buildings like the metro systems in, in, in Moscow and Kharkiv and Kiev and St. Petersburg and Tashkent. There aren't. There's nothing like that. We have nothing like that. Um, there isn't really anything either like something like the Park of Memory in Kiev. That kind of memorial architecture is very, very specific to, I think, the sheer scale of the suffering that happened uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. So that, that, that there is a kind of, there are different priorities. Actually, the thing that is most alike is the housing. You know, the, 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 a kind of, you know, a Soviet housing scheme of the 70s is kind of like a French housing scheme of the 60s, but bigger, by and large. Um, but apart from that, I think the exotica to be kind of, um, it begins with that, I think, genuine unlikeness, the fact that genuinely these architectures, which in the twenties have been developing along parallel lines, go in completely different directions. Um, but the kind of revival of interest in them in very recent years, um, goes through various kind of tropes. And here, I think the, there was a great lecture, which I don't know if it was ever published, but it probably is by um, Vladimir Kulich, who was a um, historian of architecture in socialist Yugoslavia, um, where he, you know, talks about the kind of exoticization of Yugoslav modernism and particularly of its memorial projects. Um, and that these are really, you know, kind of seen in this really, really crass way of like Tito's monuments, you know, the dictator commissioned Henry Moore. It would be as if the dictator commissioned Henry Moore or whatever. Um, you know, these bizarre enigmatic monuments that sit on barren hillsides in the middle of nowhere. And it's like, well, no, actually, these were usually decided upon by small communities and towns and workplaces who commissioned architects and artists. They had a dialogue. It wasn't a weird alien thing that happened in some strange, inexplicable world. It happened in actually a quite democratic way, a quite logical way, and it's all quite easily explained. Like, they might, the, you know, the, the, the kind of alienness in a way does come from the power of the architecture, but it also is something projected upon those places by people that come to them with Cold War stereotypes. And those Cold War stereotypes are obviously particularly non-applicable in Yugoslavia because it was, you know, never part of the Warsaw Pact, had much more significant internal freedoms, freedom of discussion and so forth. So, you know, the, the, the idea that this was some sort of totalitarian architecture from space, you know, doesn't make any sense there at all. Um, that's, which is why I think, you know, a lot of people from ex-Yugoslavia are very, very insulted by it, quite rightly. Um, when you're dealing with Ukraine in the 1960s and 1970s, you are dealing with a system which, you know, did significantly restrict freedoms. So there is a different thing going on. But I do think, 
there's a particular idea, you know, that's freighted through a combination of kind of Cold War spy films and Tarkovsky. You know, we are dealing with like a strange, barren alien landscape, which we couldn't possibly understand. And I did this in my first book because I'd not been, you know, to the strange alien landscape and it seemed an interesting way of looking at things. So I was very much kind of like, you know, and, and, and one of the first things you find if you go and visit any actual constructivist buildings is that loads of them have got like a, you know, a McDonald's in. That's not very exotic. You know, they're really quite ordinary. Um, and that, in a way, is interesting because you then see how they've continued to be part of people's everyday lives. But they're ordinary. But I think if you're kind of... And one of the things that Coolidge points out, I'll well, finish about this in a sec, but one of the things that Coolidge points to is the role of photography in all of this. You know, the, 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 the people that started, which is difficult for, you know, you and I as, as, as writers and you as an architect, to, I think, um, you know, uh, deal with in a way, but the renewal of interest didn't come from architecture and it didn't come from history, it came from photography. <clears throat> Photographers did this first. Richard Pear, Frederick Schaubern, Nicholas Grospierre, you know, um, Christopher Herwig, like these are the people that kind of went and did a load of travel, um, took a load of photographs and didn't really know what they were photographing. Um, and, you know, the, the, the better people involved in this, like Richard Pear, for whom I have a lot of respect, um, were aware of this. So they, um, you know, they talked to historians and they tried to historicise what they'd done and understood what they did through history. But a lot of other people didn't. <laughs> they weren't interested in history at all. They were interested in having incredibly alien and amazing and bizarre photographs. Um, what it was they were photographing and its actual history and its actual use and its actual kind of a function in everyday life of the people that live there was really of little interest to them because they're photographers. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You're right. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you said about uh, something like an island uh, built in the middle of nowhere, uh, I thought that it was actually the same story uh, in media, in media of the 20s, of the 30s, uh, about uh, Der Sprung. It was the same perception on, on that uh, building, like, you know, Soviets, they built something in the middle of nowhere. And it's actually some message that actually Soviets, we gave that message that we are so cool, we are so, so uh, great, that we built something in the middle of nowhere. But actually, you know that it, it wasn't built in the middle of nowhere. It's the central part of the city, and it was former university uh, valleys, uh, and uh, it should be uh, built, it should be a part of master plan for many years, even before the First World War. So it was plans to build something there, much, much earlier than 1925. But of course, it's a very beautiful idea that we can build something just say, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, that's why, you know, there is some connection between how uh, that photographers saw uh, that buildings and how actually in the 30s, in the very beginning, they will represent like some beautiful evidence of our power. Yeah, or like a kind of, you know, sort of mirage in the desert type thing. And I suppose, I suppose one could link that to, like, I, I think that's a, you know, a, a, a major debate among historians that's been going on for decades about the ways in which the Soviet Union was and wasn't an empire and the ways in which it was and wasn't colonial. But definitely one of the ways in which it was quite similar to the way that something like the British Empire worked was the way that it had this very much the sense of like, we are going into the virgin lands and building <laughs> in, in the desert, in the steppe, we are going to build our Chicago. You know, like or the, the way that like the building of somewhere like Novosibirsk is very much like, you know, um, in the middle of nowhere, we are building our great Chicago. The way that they built um, you know, particularly in Central Asia, obviously, um, and things like Moshe Ginsberg's um, building in Almaty and, you know, a lot of the work that was done also after the war in Central Asia was very much this kind of like, we are going into, 
you know, the desert and bringing the modernism, um, which always kind of conflicted with the, the way that actually you would always actually have local communists in those places that were doing their own modernism and they didn't need people to come in and do modernism for them. But that was definitely a factor. Like the, the story of like Magnitogorsk is completely that of like, you know, we're, that, that here we are in the wilderness building our wonderful city. So it's definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's an Orientalist thing then. So that makes sense that it later kind of returns as an Orientalist thing in a quite different way. Yeah, and from inside, uh, we notice the exotization, actually. Moreover, this happens not only with uh, some objects or some material objects, some buildings, some phenomena, and even historical epochs, but even with people. So it's jumped to people. Uh, for me, as for women uh, from post-Soviet space, it was all the time the situations that I met that stereotypes, that generalizations, like, you know, you're like, you're a Soviet girl, show me Soviet Union, please. <laughs> uh, and uh, where is your, uh, I don't know, some uh, red uh, flag or something like that, and just uh, talk with us with some Marxist statements and uh, Communist Party messages. Uh, you know, you feel like you're in some movie, or, I don't know or some cartoon, like your Soviet girl, Zina, <laughs> or something like that. And, and it's, it's very difficult that you should all the time to oppose to the stereotypes. You should all the time to start dialogue from that. No, please, don't do that. Uh, I will not do that. Things, let's start normal dialogue. And then maybe, let's see, will I show you Soviet Union or not? What do you think? What is wrong with that? exotization, how that mechanism works and uh, maybe there is something good in that, in that relationship between different, uh, different worlds through exotization. So I suppose, you know, one of my favorite kind of, um, this is going to sound very highfalutin, but my, my, one of the concepts I've always kind of uh, liked and I've always sort of worked with and tried to kind of bring into things is the idea from Viktor Shklovsky of, you know, making strange, you know, we, the, the, from the, the, the kind of essay on artist device and his, you know, essays of the early 20s and Night's Move and Third Factory and all of these things, all of these wonderful books. This idea that, you know, the, the thing that you do as an aesthetician, as a writer, as an architect, as an artist, as a filmmaker, whatever you're doing, you know, the thing that, you, that, that, that you're trying to do is to kind of introduce a strangeness to the everyday or a strangeness to something normal. So make people look at a thing and actually see it. That's always the thing of Shklovsky. And there's that passage, I think he quotes from Tolstoy, of, you know, I can't remember what the, what the novel is, but, you know, it's very much a thing of, like, I think the character's bereaved or something, and then he's walking around the place where he lives, and he's suddenly realizing that because this kind of layer of habit has been taken off him by, by what's happened to him, that he's actually seeing all of the things that he's, that he's passing through. Um, so on that level, making something strange, because that is Shklovsky's term, is Australian, you know, this kind of idea that you make a thing strange, um, is good and it's interesting. So I don't think it's entirely a bad thing as such. I don't think we should just stress the kind of mundanity of something. Like, for, so for instance, um, first time I went to um, Kiev in 2010 was um, with uh, Agata because she was invited as part of the um, publisher Ben Smyana that she was working for at the time to um, talk about guidebooks about city guides. And there were invited people from Budapest, from Berlin, I think, and from Kharkiv, Odessa, Kherson, various places across Ukraine. And we were very much kind of talking to the Kharkiv people, oh, well, you have all of this amazing constructivism, you know, do, is, this, is this in your guide? And they were like, no. And we were like, why not? It's amazing. And they were like, we have to look at it every day. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Like, if I was doing a guide to London, I would include loads of buildings that I look at every day. Like, that's the point. Like, and, but that, that showed that for them, 
it was such an everyday thing. There was no way that anyone could possibly be interested in, Ukra in, in Ukrainian constructivism because every day they looked at it. So the, the familiarity had dulled their idea that anybody would find it interesting. And so that's where I think, you know, looking at things and making them strange is important. It's going like, no, this thing that you walk past every day and don't look at, you should look at because it's really interesting. And it is really interesting. So that is positive. And I think the positive aspect of this in a way is that all of these photographers and Instagram accounts and coffee table books have forced people, and it's the same actually with modern architecture in Britain, that again, kind of in a way, photographers took the lead quite a bit and sort of forced people to actually look at these things a bit, which beforehand they wouldn't. And then actual kind of historical, political, sociological engagement often came after that because people were shown a thing that they hadn't looked at before and shown it in a new way and then gone, oh, this is way more interesting than I thought. I had no idea how interesting this was. And so that, that's, that's positive. The problem is just doing it without any fucking tact. So the, the book that um, is often kind of pointed to in this, which is slightly unfair on the photographer because, you know, text to text and advertising and advertising, but there was a book that came out a few years ago called Soviet Ghosts. And it was a photo book and it was all full of this kind of like, no one passes through the dark door of the empire to take back these images of incredible concrete spaceships and terrorist lairs and totalitarian, you know, cities of steel or whatever. You know, it was all this stuff. It was, it was kind of heavy breathing kind of like, you know, um, kind of science fiction film stuff. And it was just like, you know, you should sh show some respect, I think, on some level. You know, you're not dealing, you mean, you know, where you are dealing with the remnants of a dead civilization because that civilization doesn't exist anymore. But millions and millions of people live in the remnants of that dead civilization and live in it and work in it. So you've got to, I think, just have some respect. But I don't think one should go too far the other way of going like, this stuff's just there and it's boring. But then I don't really think anything is boring, so I'm not really the ideal, <laughs> the ideal person to talk to on this. Yeah, but you know, I think that that part of making things strange or to focus on some objects that nobody see and uh, just to go somewhere like for vacation, you know, to, or to great tour. For me, it's the question, maybe. All tourism, tourism in general, tourism as a phenomena, maybe it should have that part of exotization because you should go somewhere and you should think, I should go there because very strange objects are there. Why I should go to boring things? Yeah, I should go to some very interesting things. But when you are, for example, a guide, when you are here and all the time that is like a crowds of tourists, crowds of tourists. I'm really grateful to uh, coronavirus that all that crowd stopped <laughs> because I was so tired. Each day, each week, some people uh, wrote me and asked about some tour uh, to Soviet heritage, to Soviet world, to Soviet past. Uh, and uh, to constructivism and modernism and brutalism and postmodernism and everything is between. And uh, it was all the, all the time the same. They, they, they actually uh, wanted to see uh, that exotic things. They had that expectations that I will show them that the desert and some uh, beautiful, huge, uh, concrete, uh, awful, uh, grey buildings uh, like in Chernobyl uh, TV series, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. So show me Chernobyl, you know, that is the main, yeah. uh, the, the main uh, message. And uh, it's a bit, it's, it's like ob objectivization, you know, nothing subjective there. Uh, and nothing about myself, for example, where is me in that dialogue? That is the question. And uh, I remember it was the situation that I uh, guided a tour to uh, Kharkiv tractor factory, you know, that, that is uh, my obsession. So that is the topic of my dissertation. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that district it's something very important for me because I'm in third generation from that district. My great grand uh, mother she lived there in thirties. That's why it's, it's a very deep uh, personal connection with that place, with community, because I led a lot of tours for children from uh, poor districts, uh, because that is actually poor district, it's bad district. Uh, and uh, we had some project, participative project with community and so on. And I remember that it was a tour with uh, some uh, professors, scholars from the USA, it was a very small group, and they did nothing bad, uh, but we uh, walked uh, through the district, Sotsgorod, you know, so socialist city in Kharkiv, and then we stood uh, near dormitory house, huge dormitory house uh, at Kharkiv tractor factory, and it looked awful. People lived there in very bad conditions. It's a really a very depressed place uh, with very bad conditions, with a lot of uh, social problems, economical problems and so on. People, they just abandoned there in their dormitory house and that dormitory house actually looked like that. And we just stood near that and look at. And then the man from one window opened that window and screamed to us, you are not in zoo, we need the park. And I was so shocked, you know, it's like, I thought, oh my God, what I'm doing actually? <laughs> what is my role in that thing? Because that person, he really felt like, like animal in zoo. And I don't want to be a part of that process. And for, for many years, I, I, I thought, how to avoid that shame that, that I'm showing that exotic things and that that exotic things, they led to be treated as animal, actually, in zoo. And that is awful, absolutely. It's completely what I don't want to do, actually. So, what do you think? It's actually, it can be the part of traveling or tourism, especially from richer countries to more poor countries. It's like the part of that process, poor people, degraded places and all that things. How to avoid the things and how to travel in more, I don't know, human or ecological way. I mean, I certainly think, I mean, I've done plenty of, 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 of tours myself as a tour guide and I always do find them uncomfortable. Um, and I think one of the things is, if you're bringing a group of people who are taking photographs of a place in a group, that's just the format of that is like that. You know, it's always going to have that sense that the people have come in here from outside. And usually, like, I mean, I've done quite a lot in uh, of tours of 20th century social housing in, in Britain. And... I think almost all the tours I've guided myself have been in Britain, except for once in, in Warsaw. And first of all, one of the things you always get asked in Britain, when you're in one of those groups, is, are you from the council? And again, that's, you know, because, and that's an acknowledgement of the fact that those groups are always middle class. They're a group of middle class people with nice cameras, and, you know, nice clothes, going and photographing places where other people live. And that's not, it's not quite as acute in London because of the fact that London, everyone lives very much on top of each other. So there's not quite the same sense that going into a social housing estate in London is going from zone A to zone B. But outside of it, you go into like Milton Keynes or somewhere or Southampton, people immediately look at you and like, what the fuck are you doing here? and ask you if you're from the council, <laughs> um, because that's their, their authority figure. It's like, you're from the council, you must be here to, I don't know, you know, renovate the buildings, check out crime, you know, do some canvassing, whatever. You must be here doing something official. Um, and the idea that you're just there to look at some buildings is the last thing that anyone thinks you're actually doing. I'm sure if you'd said that, you know, at 
the tractor factory. Oh, we're here to look at that building. Why? You know, like, it's falling apart. What do you want to see here? What are you looking at? Um, and it's really difficult. I'm much more comfortable doing, like, writing maps because that kind of little... But I've done one recently for the, for, for, for the Open, Open City charity in, in, in London. And it's much more comfortable doing that because you can go as one person or two people with the map and you don't have the same sense that you're part of an expedition. Um, and that thing of being on an expedition is really hard to, to do in a way that's, that's tactful and respectful. Um, ideally, and I haven't usually done this because I'm lazy, um, but ideally, you should be making contact with people there beforehand. Like one of the things that, you know, I, I, I probably should do is talk to people from like the Tenants and Residents Association in the housing estate. We're going to do a walk through your estate. We're going to do it at this time. You know, if you want to be part of it, if you don't want us to do it, let us know. And I don't do that because I'm, I'm profoundly lazy. Um, but, you know, that that is a, uh, a thing I think that people should probably do. Certainly organisations that are large, like something like Doc Momo, that should be the, the basic thing that you, that you do. It's like, have you checked this out with people there? Did they know you're going to do it? Um, but that doesn't get away from the central central problem, which is... You know, in the British example, it's people from, from wealthy areas going to poor areas. And the example of people going to, uh, you know, um, particularly going to Pripyat, it's people from rich countries going to, going to you know, uh, a, a poor country. And that's, you know, that I, I think in a way, you know, I mean, this is a cop-out in a way, but the solution to that is political rather than, rather than architectural. There's no... Um, there's no way you can close that gap. There's ways in which you can, you know, and there's all sorts of organisations trying to do ethical tourism. There's ways in which you can, you can't close the gap, but you can easily, you know, obscure the gap. You can kind of make the gap a bit, a bit less, a bit less cute, a bit less, a bit less harsh. But the gap's always going to be there. Um, and that is very much to do with, the simple fact that in a way that, you know, the architecture and, and, and urbanism have remained an elite interest. You know, they have been a thing. I, I don't subscribe to the idea that everyone has always been hostile to modern architecture. I don't believe that's true historically. I think, you know, in the 1960s, I think most people very much wanted to get out of the 19th century housing and into 20th century housing. So I don't agree with that, that, that idea, but it is true that it has always been a thing that an elite has, has, has done and which other people have then generally had to live with. Um, and, you know, that's... Uh, it's so much part of the story of modern architecture in a way that it's it's hard to kind of think of a way out of it in a way. Um, my own personal way out of it, I suppose, is that I've tried to do it as much as possible through politics. So I've tried to do it through, um, as much as possible sort of through writing about these things politically, through publishing and, you know, and, and, and working for um, political magazines like Tribune, you know, for trying to kind of get people from political movements interested in, in that housing and, 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 and its legacies. Um, but, that, I mean, that's been how I've approached it. But there's probably all sorts of other ways which are, which are better. But that's the way I've tried. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And maybe the one thing that we can do, just try uh, actually, and uh, great uh, thought about uh, the gap. <laughs> I will think about that in future because you know it's like a part of my psychological process of uh, healing with all that stuff. Because uh, you know, when you are all the time you are a part of that uh, that uh, society, actually that community of Kharkiv and first of all like the part of uh, very uh, difficult districts very poor districts like Kharkiv tractor factory you all the time feel guilt you all the time feel that you should do something and that doing 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 and that 
you just understand that you actually can't do things because it's again political question. All the time that is political question. And you know, that dormitory houses, like the part of uh, like socialist realist critics, they call that social experiments of uh, constructivism, like commune houses and so on. That is actually a very problematic building because uh, people live there without kitchen. They live there with just one toilet on the floor. And uh, they have no elevator, they have awful conditions. And actually, that, that much more economical question, because uh, who is guilt? I remember when uh, I guided a tour for school boys and school girls from a uh, local school, they actually asked again near yeah, the dormitory house. You know, the dormitory house is like a place for questions. Uh, so children, maybe they were 12 year, years old, they asked me who is guilty, architects or society. It was so interesting, 12 years old, and they asked the, that main question of late Soviet uh, literature about architecture, who is guilty. And, uh, and I have actually no answer, but I'm definitely sure that uh, if... Uh, the city council is in response of that conditions of people. They actually are guilty, not people and not Akinex. Uh, that was my answer to the children. I'm still thinking about that, and uh, maybe the uh, aggressive behavior of that uh, dwellers of dormitory house uh, somehow related that they. Uh, you can't say that you went there just to see and, or just to look at architecture. They know that that architecture is uh, some evidence of their poverty. So, and uh, they understood that message, that you went there just to look at their very bad conditions and to their poverty. And that you judge them for that. I think that is the point. Yeah, absolutely. But I think there's a, I mean, the situation there is, you know, there's so, I think the majority of situations are still those where, you know, there's places that, that, that are quite dilapidated where there's still a lot of, 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 of social stigma. But I think there's almost a kind of, then there becomes a kind of careful what you wish for question of what then happens when the thing that weirdos like us you know, kind of have of like, we actually think these buildings are wonderful and they should be saved and they should be preserved. When we actually manage to convince people in authority, it can then happen in a way that we really do not expect. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the talking about communal houses and obviously, you know, the kind of like no kitchen or only tiny kitchen type thing, obviously the most famous there is always going to be Narkomfin in Moscow. And, you know, obviously Narkomfin has been, um, is I think soon to be, I'm not sure if it's actually been finished yet, but it's soon to be reopened, completely renovated, by you know, total kind of Dokomomo standards. Like they've made it look like it did in 1930. You know, they've, 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 they've I mean, Ginsberg's, uh, the architect's grandson, you know, like Alexei Ginsberg has you know, been involved in this, of like making it look like it did in 1930. And restoring all of the features that, that, that residents and the owners had, had kind of gradually got rid of, you know, the kind of open floor, the roof garden, you know, the communal block with the library, which have, been, which have looked terrible since the 1970s, all now look wonderful. And the people that lived there obviously don't live there anymore. And so there's, you know, the, the, there was a similar thing here with... Um, with two kind of 1960s buildings with um, Park Hill Estate in Sheffield and Balfour Tower by Anna Goldfinger in London, that exactly the same process had happened of like, we have restored this wonderful building, this wonderful utopian experiment by making sure that those who live there live somewhere else. And that I think is one of the things that should be absolutely most resisted. Um, I think it's a long way off happening in Kharkiv um, but it is a thing that, you know, by now is already happening in Moscow. And I think, you know, you could imagine it happening with some of the kind of major 
um, 20th century buildings in Kiev, like the doctor's house in the centre of Kiev, you could imagine that being beautifully renovated because it's such a beautiful building and it's so badly treated that you can imagine that being, you know, sold as an investment opportunity and sold to hipsters and sold to enthusiasts. Um, and in Kiev, there's enough money for that to work. So, you know, that, that, that could happen. And that's, and you're then compounding the problem. You know, the first problem of like, why are you staring at my dilapidated house becomes why are you kicking me out of my dilapidated house? So you can then sell it to people that like the architecture. It's monstrous. <laughs> you know, and that, that, that I think, so it all kind of goes down to a question, I think, of popular education. And that's what's so difficult of like, architects have always been really, really bad at communicating what they're doing to the public and why. And there's always been very, very little public education on architecture. And architects often seem like they like it just fine that way. Um, and that, you know, and I think postmodernism in a way was about trying to overcome that, although I think they, um, you know, overcame it in a direction that I do not personally like. But they at least recognise the problem. They recognise that as a problem. And I don't really know how to, you know, that, that one of the things I guess that's, that's interesting about activism and treating this as an activist issue is that you are then actually doing it in such a way that you are bringing people into it in a way that they don't necessarily need to have an architectural education and going like, and bringing them in in a popular way. And actually, you know, although I criticise them, all of the kind of Instagram accounts do that too. I mean, I follow like, there seem to currently be like hundreds of like Ukrainian modernism and socialist modernism and mosaic Instagram accounts. Hundreds of them. I don't know where they all are coming from. Like, and they just appear from throughout the post-Soviet space. Like I saw one recently from Baku, a city I've never visited. And it's like Baku mosaics. And it's like, I had never seen any of these before. And they just, they just turn up and... Actually, most of them don't come from people with an architectural education. They come from people that, that, that see things in that very visual way because of the internet and because of smartphones and so forth. They, 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 they treat their environment in a very, very visual way. And also they're deeply, deeply nostalgic in a way that, you know, younger people often do have a great deal of nostalgia for the generation just before them. So that kind of leads us out in a way into a place where it actually becomes a public topic of debate rather than the topic of architects talking to other architects. And that's probably positive. So the problem in that is losing the actual fact that these are places where people live. And that they're so often seen as the problem. And I, I think that, you know, it was a discussion in the 30s, in the 20s, uh, what is first, ethics or aesthetics? So, and uh, I think the, the question is, what is first, again, people or architecture? And uh, your example about Narcomfin, that is the same example about, I think, fetishism fetishism of um, making that social experiment, utopian experiment, like a fetish. And where is people? That is the question. Because for me, as an architect, actually, people, they are my customer. And even in all that protectionist movements, uh, thinking about constructivism or modernist architecture, how to preserve that, how to make renovations, for me, I'm still architect. And for me, it's still the main question, what about people? I think that is the difference, maybe, in approach how to deal with such, such very difficult things as uh, very poor people living in very poor and very bad conditions that actually we produced as an architect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've solved the problem now. <laughs>